Welcome to the Baseball Insiders. I'm Adam Weiner wearing a vintage hat. You see, there used to be this team called the Oakland A's. They had some pretty fun seasons and good crowds once upon a time. Here live on a beautiful Thursday with Fanside, it's MLB Insider Robert Murray. And because it's Thursday, that means we are one day away from the non-tender deadline where some players will be not tendered contracts for 2024. Some players will be traded to avoid that roster crunch. We are fresh off some Rule 5 protections uh, earlier this week that told some of the story, but not all of it. And we are going to get into which players are on the block, who's in danger of leaving, plus plenty more trending topics, the sentiment around the A's and John Fisher. Brian Cashman talking himself into a corner with Yoshinobu Yamamoto, potentially even the Red Sox scoring a coup in the coaching department. And here to talk me through this, as always, is fan side of MLB insider Robert Murray. Robert, let's go. Let's go, baby. It's going to end up being a very active 24 hours here is my guess. Much more active than it was for the Rule 5 deadline because that was basically a snooze fest. It was only the – it was a trade between the Brewers and Phillies, and that was seemingly it. And we saw a trade with the Brewers yesterday, so that was kind of exciting. Uh, trading Abraham Toro to the Oakland A's. Uh, I'm expecting more movement in the coming 24 hours, as I said. But before we get to that movement, Adam Weinrib, here we are for another podcast. How are we doing, good sir? Here we are. I feel good. It's a hell of a time to do a show right before the holiday when the offseason really gets started. Awards week, non-tender week, etc. There's no better time than now to join us in our Discord channel where Robert and I will answer questions between shows last couple episodes we've gotten some people becoming members of the youtube channel members of the discord during the show we'd love to see that again if uh you're in it and you love it tell your friends we've been really active the last couple weeks so we'd love to see you join if you need the info it will certainly be in the description and we're also going to be doing some more q a's heading into the next month or so of shows heading into the winter meetings heading into all that juicy stuff so look, keep an eye out on Robert's Twitter account too for some uh, question and answer opportunities there. We will certainly get to them. A lot of great questions already being asked today. We will uh, answer a bunch of them in the back half of this show as well as potentially as the show goes on. Today's sponsorship, the Baseball Insiders, is partnering with Sleeper Daily Fantasy to give new users a first deposit match up to $100. Make sure to use our code FANSIDED2, that's FANSIDED and the number two, when signing up to receive your deposit match. Please remember to always game responsibly. Scan the QR code on the screen to see if you qualify. And Robert, at some point over the next 24 hours, some baseball players who probably think they're safe with their current franchise are going to get an email and just be like, oh, that's, wait, what? I don't play, I don't have a contract? That sucks. Um, It's that time of the year again. Yes, it is. There is, it's that time of the year. I don't know if we're going to be in for some, any big surprises? Not that I've gathered so far, but like I'll give you a couple of things to keep an eye on. Yes. Um, for the tender deadline here, and then also um, just for moving forward here at the, at the in the off season. First of all, I don't know if this is necessarily applies to the tender deadline. I think this applies for the off season as a whole. But it sounds like the Twins have been relatively active in the trade market. I don't necessarily know who, what, or what they're targeting, but. It seems like they're pretty active on the trade market here. Um, So that could be something to watch out for in the coming days, coming weeks, coming months, maybe. Um, But as far as the non-tenders, there is a good amount of players here um, that could end up fitting this description. And I'll start in Milwaukee. I think a guy who is at risk of being non-tendered is Rowdy Telez. Uh, We saw them trade Abraham Toro, who looked like another strong candidate. Uh, to be non-tendered, uh, traded him to Oakland. It wouldn't surprise me if the Brewers saw Telez, whose production last year was not what uh, it had been in the past. Uh, it, it didn't live up, live up to standards, and I could see him, them trying to move on, considering his salary is gonna uh, gonna be pretty inflated for the first base position there. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if, at all if he's non-tendered or traded. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about Brandon Woodruff. I don't necessarily know if I have a feel for that one quite yet. Like. You can make the case for him getting non-tendered. I don't think they will. That's just a guess. Uh, I think he is a, a prime candidate for a short-term extension and keeping him there in Milwaukee because everything that you've I've heard about Milwaukee's their plan is that they still want to compete in 2023. They, oh, well, they want to compete in 2024 and beyond. And Woodruff would seemingly be a big part of that. 
And especially with the real possibility of them not having Corbin Burns um, after next year, or maybe there's even a shot they move him this off season. I don't necessarily know there, but before I go out on to different teams here, I want to make one thing clear is I had Brewers fans coming at me hardcore last week after our show and saying that I was like, they, they were quoting me as saying that the Brewers are going to have a big rebuild um, and that they were destined to trade all of these certain players. I did not say that. Yeah. I said, they, there's going to be a lot of these teams who look at the players that they have and going to inquire and see what it's going to take to, to get them via trade. You look at Corbin Burns, very attractive trade target. And I would imagine at some point, maybe it's the off season, maybe it's the trade deadline. They look to move him to try to get some value before he leaves in free agency. Uh, Willie Adamas, another prime candidate uh, for that same exact thing. Um, you have Freddie Peralta as well, who is going to attract interest, but I would be stunned if they moved him just because his contract is quite affordable. Um, so I, the, there's going to be plenty of teams who would call about those guys and others. Um, that does not necessarily mean that they're going to move those players, but they have attractive trade pieces and teams are going to call, come calling about those guys. And then some other ones to watch for uh, Manny Margot with the yes. Rays. There's a lot of trade buzz. Uh, surrounding him, I would put him in the extremely likely category to get moved. Uh, I don't have a timetable on that one, but it seems like the Mets and the Yankees, like those are two teams that I heard previously. Uh, the reports there are accurate that those two teams were among those to inquire. And then finally, we have Ryan Yarbo, uh, Yarborough uh, with the Dodgers. Uh, he is another one who I think has a shot at either being non-tendered or moved. Uh, by tomorrow, there's others that I'm that I'm sure I missed here, but those are just some names that I'll I'm saying to keep an eye on, and for the next 24 hours and beyond here. I'm sniffing around. Uh, you know, of course, we have some commenters bringing up the Red Sox with Reese McGuire. That sounds like a possibility to me, even though he's performed fairly well during his time in Boston. Um, the New York Yankees, you know, there weren't a lot of major moves on Rule Five Protection Day. But the Yankees did protect uh, catcher Augustine Ramirez, who was on the fence. And the reason why that's notable is not because Augustine Ramirez is going to start next year or make the roster, but that gives them six catchers on the 40-man currently. They added Carlos Narvaez a couple weeks ago, too. He's even lower in the system than Ramirez. Ben Rortvet, Jose Trevino coming back, Austin Wells, Kyle Higashioka. So Kyle Higashioka seems like the clear odd man out. Ben Rordfett might not be someone they care to retain either. Um, but there were a couple weeks ago, I think Andy Martino had a piece out that was like, hey, if you're looking for a catcher, call the Yankees about a trade. And the whole time I was wondering, everybody knows these guys are going to get not tender. Like, why would why would anybody call if they know they could just have Kyle Gashioka on Friday evening? So um, I would suspect the Yankees free that one up. Also eyeing Lou Trevino there, who's rehabbing for almost the entire season. And Jonathan Lewisaga, who Brian Cashman said outwardly as Aaron Boone actually said, he's great when he's available, but he's almost never available. And that doesn't seem like a recipe to want to spend $3.8 million on a power reliever for this season. So just a few more names I'm looking at to keep an eye on. Obviously that is not sourced, but the catcher stuff is just logic. Yeah, for sure. And it also, another thing to keep an eye on as far as the catcher market, there's not really that many good options available in free agency. Like, uh, let me look at it real quick. Because, uh, I mean, you got Mitch Garver, yeah. you got Victor Caratini, you got Maldonado, you got Austin Hedges, uh, Yasmani Grandal. I mean, not very inspiring there at all. No. Um, so I think catchers are going to be there as a pre or at a premium for sure. Uh, the ones at least that are on the rosters now. And it's another reason why, like. Yep. Looks like we got a little freezing issue. Um, and that's no problem. I'm a classically trained journalist. Unlike Carissa Thompson, I know how to vamp. Um, <laughs> you guys see earlier, she said she makes up answers on sideline reports. Uh, that's what that was a reference to. All good. Um, we've got plenty more to touch on for the rest of this show, including I see in the comments, people asking about Tyler Glass now. We will certainly get to that. People asking about Juan Soto. Uh, it's a weird time right now for me to talk about a Juan Soto trade. Peter Seidler passing away, the Padres owner earlier this week. Um, of course, ironically, Jeff Passan's report did come out this week saying the Cubs, Mariners, and Yankees will all pursue him. 
Padres don't know if he's available yet. The Padres seek upper tier pitching, but the Cubs and Mariners don't want to give up the upper tier pitching they have or could have or could swap. Uh, so look, you're not alone. Uh, comment section for uh, Paul Waymond for saying like, Hey, doesn't that kind of feel like Soto to the Yankees is a lock, but the Padres have to uh, shake hands on that too. The Padres have to actually float Soto. The Padres have to be aligned on being relatively non-competitive for next year. Uh, and without that occurring, uh, we can't green light a deal from either side. So I'm hearing what you're hearing too. I'm, I'm picking up what Jeff Passon's putting down. And he certainly phrased the report that way on purpose in order to get that exact reaction. But the Padres are in a precarious spot right now. Um, saving money, still of paramount importance, but it's not quite as simple A to B as it was before. Um, they're going to have to make some really hard decisions, and they're going to have to do it without the leader of that team, of that franchise, and the man who, in many ways, revitalized sports in that city, a city that has still never won a championship. So they're going to have to choose between inspirational season with a memorial patch and a good roster or same thing in a middling roster that saves money. So uh, stay tuned there, but I don't, I think it's a little too soon to talk about that. Um, everybody's got questions about their specific team. Uh, we love you all. Um, we're going to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Robert is working hard to rejoin us. I think uh, he's having some trouble, but he's working on it. So we'll absolutely have him back. Uh, and if not, uh, we'll come back at a more convenient time. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the first 10 minutes of the show. Um, looking for anything I can answer first. I guess I might just complain about the Oakland A's for a little bit while I'm here. Um, because today's move was a fait accompli. We all knew John Fisher was going to get the move to Las Vegas approved. We knew it months ago. We knew it a year ago. A's fan protests could only do so much. They could do almost nothing, Right. There was almost nothing those were going to accomplish other than show Major League Baseball that it was prepared to make a mistake. And then Rob Manfred said, okay, I'm, I, I knew that already, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do it. The part that I don't think we did know until today was the fact that they're not going to have a home stadium from 2024 through 2027. They're going to be nomadic. They're going to play at the San Francisco Giants Stadium. I mean, are we serious? Triple A stadium in Vegas makes more sense than sharing real estate with the San Francisco Giants. I can't believe, I cannot believe that Major League Baseball's grand plan to get professional baseball in Las Vegas without an expansion team was we don't have a stadium. We have a timeline uh, where there specifically will not be a stadium. We have baked in some years without a home and we're just going to wing it. Um, so I, I'm going to get Robert's thoughts later for sure on uh the general vibe around Major League Baseball and around uh, Fisher and around what he did or did not do alongside Rob Manfred to keep the A's in town. But Robert Murray is back. Nobody else wants my A's thoughts now. Robert, uh, I, I think I did a pretty good monologue. We didn't lose that much of the crowd. Oh, thank God. Because, yeah, I'll tell you, my internet just went out. So that's uh, – or Cox could not have picked a worse time to go out in my area. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. They picked a slightly worse time. They picked, uh, he goes, oh, they could not have picked a worse time. And I go, you're totally right. And then uh, they picked an even worse time to go out. We're going to give it a few more minutes, I think. Uh, and then if we can't get Robert in, we will regroup and certainly continue to report. But luckily, we got all the non-tender conversations out first. People joining the stream, I see Robert Murray will be right back. He is working through some internet issues. We will not cut this stream short that is not what this means we will certainly get to the end of this uh discuss everything that needs to be discussed for sure <laughs> it's back again um wow yeah i don't know how long i'm gonna end up being here my internet's brutal this is really bad i apologize to everyone who's still tuned in uh that is the first time this has ever happened so not your fault not your fault at all we'll try to get to the q a later but i do want to talk about uh yamamoto's market and what brian cashman did or did not do to it uh, while we've still got you. I shared my thoughts on the A's while you were gone. And I think um, I'd love your take on what Major League Baseball, you know, what the vibe is around Major League Baseball there. But uh, Brian Cashman flamed Giancarlo Stanton publicly, maybe forgot that Stanton's agent also happens to be Yoshinobu Yamamoto's agent, Joel Wolf, big time representative for a lot of different players, but only one player who Brian Cashman flew to Japan to scout earlier this year. So I ask you, 
important team, important player, important agent, important executive. You'd have to think this can't kill the potential of a deal between the two parties, but with so many teams involved, it also can't be good, right? No. Well, here's here's where I'm at is I, I don't necessarily know how much of an impact that had on this entire Yamamoto sweepstakes. Is the Cashman's comments, <laughs> they were not good. Uh, I cannot sugarcoat that. Like those, He's been on an all-time heater lately. Uh, with what he did at the GM meetings, and then now is talking about what he did with Giancarlo Stanton uh, and his health. And um, Joe Wolf, who was a very reserved, quiet, just like a good man, uh, the fact that he spoke out shows just how upset that he was. But he was defending his client, which that's part of his job. Um, but I don't think what he says about Giancarlo Stanton necessarily impacts the market for Yamamoto. And I still am under the impression the Yankees are going to be involved. Um, I can't imagine Wolf and Yamamoto are going to eliminate the Yankees from the sweepstakes because of these comments. Like, I mean, the Yankees are one of the biggest markets in baseball, if not the biggest market. And eliminating them would potentially leave money on the table because their presence always leaves or always results in the dollar amount going up. Uh, so there, I don't, I don't envision that having an impact on this at all, but still, I don't understand what Cashman was trying to accomplish there. His GM meetings rant, as I said in the last podcast, is something we're going to be talking about for 10 years. And it's just, it was an all time rant. I don't understand what he's doing, but evidently he's, he's fed up with a lot of this stuff and, and now he's taking on Andre Carlos Stanton. Yeah, welcome to the club. I haven't understood Brian Cashman for like six years. So I think I'm glad the world is starting to see this. But yeah, all the reports that came out through Andy Martino, of course, about how Yamamoto loves the Yankees brand. They came out right on time because you can't end the Yankees portion of the Yamamoto chase now. You got to extend that through the end of the conversation. Um, Big name. I'm going to get to these cues for sure. Big name I'm seeing chattered a lot about is Tyler Glass now. Someone you have mentioned in the past as being on the trade block. Someone the commenters are mentioning as being a potential Dodger. I want to get your thoughts on the pulse of that situation for now. Do you still think he's more than likely gone in Tampa Bay? And what destinations are you looking at? Yeah, so I'll start with a question that was ended up that was asked before I ended up having my internet issues. It was, who is the most likely pitcher to get traded? Is it Tyler Glasnow, is it Corbin Burns, or is it Dylan Cease? And I will definitively say it is Tyler Glasnow. He is... I would be relatively stunned if he has not moved at some point this offseason. And the Rays, they're listening on Glasnow. There's there's going to be plenty of interest there. He's a really talented pitcher, sat for one year. Obviously, $25 million is a, a pretty high number, and that's why, or part of the part of the reason why uh, he's a trade candidate is, is the Rays just can't pay that. And if you look at some other teams that make sense for him, like, yeah, the Dodgers make plenty of sense. I also think a team like the Atlanta Braves, who I have been told are desperate and being aggressive for a starting pitcher, uh, could certainly make some sense there too. Um, I think there's just a a wide variety of teams that make sense for Glasnow, and I think he is about as good as gone in Tampa Bay at this point. I think he is a very strong bet to be traded, um, and possibly before too long. And also, like, Go, I want to answer this question from uh, from Vivek here. Will I was going to go there tie, too. Will Shoei sign before the winter meetings? My guess is yes. That is my guess right now. I think he signs before the winter meetings. There you go. If anybody's got Shohei speculation, make sure you do it quickly. Uh, there was some Shohei chatter earlier as well, because of course there was, because why wouldn't there be? Uh, people talking about the Red Sox connection, people talking about the Cubs connection that's sort of been going viral on Reddit today. Um, obviously, Reddit is Reddit, but certainly those two teams have uh, remained in the mix. Jeff Passan's column this week was like, Dodgers, Dodgers, Dodgers. Yeah, but he's intrigued by the Rangers. He's intrigued by Fenway. He loves Boston. Um, anything specific you're hearing as, again, the race kind of heats up. If it's before the winter meetings, we're well under a month countdown to potential Otani watch ending. Yeah, I, I think there's... <sighs> It's, it's really interesting here with, with Otani's market. Is obviously, you can look at the Cubs, who I think are definitely going to be a player in this. You look at the Dodgers. I still think the Texas Rangers are a team to watch. Um, 
and you look at the possibility of the Giants. Uh, there's a lot of these different teams that you think or that I think could be involved here. I, I, I think the bidding for Otani is going to start with a five. I know there's still some people in baseball who think that contract could start with a six. Kind of crazy. Um, I don't necessarily think it'll get to the six six hundred million number, but I don't know that for sure. I mean, there's these teams where we saw it last off season where a lot of like these contracts were they had a lot of years to them, and it, it increased the dollar amount for sure. But it obviously stretch out the AAV, which helped teams in the short term. Um, but just I think I think it's going to be somewhere in the mid fives is my guess for Otani. I won't. I won't predict the landing spot. I think the prediction game is a very dangerous game to play, um, and I try to stay out of the where he's going to. I'm going to stay out of the, the predicting where he's going to end up going. Um, yeah. Johnny's also asking for Cubs rumors here. I think they're going to end up being a relatively active team this winter. They're uh, starting pitching. I've heard at the GM meetings they were meeting with a bunch of different agents for relievers. Um, Let's see. I, I don't think they're going to re-sign Bellinger. Mm-hmm. Um, there was some Corbin Burns smoke today, but I'll, like, there, well, when I say that, it was from ESPN, and it's not from me. I would be really, 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 really surprised if the Brewers made a trade with the Cubs, let alone one involving Corbin Burns going to Chicago. Um, especially... Like, the Brewers aren't happy about the council situation. Yeah, not at all. And um, I can't imagine they're going to end up they're going to end up trading their best player or one of their best players to their biggest rival, especially after they took their manager. I would not pay much attention to that at all. No, it's not going to be easy to mend those fences, which didn't really even exist in the first place. Um, going to go with a couple more teams. Uh, we got some uh, thirsty fans, and rightfully so looking for their teams to be addressed heading into the meaty part of the offseason. Um, I'll go Giants first just because you mentioned you think Bellinger maybe not uh, a return to the Cubs and the Cards. I've seen John Heyman sort of say the Yankees, Cubs, and Giants will be in that market, and maybe even to the end. Uh, so I'll use that as a jumping off point. Do you think those other two teams are realistic Bellinger landing spots uh, in the same way that you don't feel like he'll end up in Chicago? Yeah, I think they're, those two are definite possibilities for Bellinger. I, I think the Giants have long made sense uh, for Bellinger, especially with the Farhan Zaidi uh, connection there. Obviously, they know each other from from their time in Los Angeles. Um, I, I think the Yankees are certainly going to be in that market as well. They were in that market at the trade deadline. I would imagine they're going to continue to poke around here. But with, as far as like going back to the Giants for a second, I really think the name to watch there is Matt Chapman. Yeah. That is... Definitely, I think that one's got a, a real shot at happening. Um, I don't want to say for sure it's happening because you never know in free agency. Like one team could come in with an offer that'll blow away another team. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think the Giants are definitely a team to watch for Chapman for sure. And then another team, I think I mentioned this on the podcast or previous podcast, is um, Arizona. Arizona's poking around for a third baseman, and I think Chapman is uh, is a is a possibility there. Although it could be too expensive. Like I've said in the past, though, that's what the money is for. No matter how big or small the market is, the Giants spent all last offseason getting outbid. I can't imagine they would want to get outbid again for two or three of their top targets, even in a relatively weak offensive market. I'm going to do two more questions. I'm going to give Canyon Swartz this one because he is a vaunted member of our Discord. We love you. Uh, any updates on the Pittsburgh Pirates? who I know were awaiting an Oviedo diagnosis earlier this week. We were Pirates fans in, on this podcast earlier in the season. We said next year's the year. I don't know how you're feeling about the way they're going to treat next year's roster. Yeah, I, I think next year is going to be their first real shot at contending for a playoff spot. That is what they view internally as well. And I would expect them to spend this offseason um, – be a little bit more aggressive this offseason. I'm not saying they're going to be in on Otani or any of these guys, but um, I think starting pitching is definitely going to be a, be a focus for them. I think um, they're going to try to add some more veteran bats to that lineup because I know they really liked what, let's say, like a, a Carlos Santana or like even going on the pitching side, they loved what Rich Hill brought and Austin Hedges as well and that veteran core. And I think they're going to continue to address that this off season, try to add some 
some veterans, but also some some impact players who are going to end up forming a really solid group alongside those young players. And I, it's it's not going to be any big names, I don't think, but it's going to be it's going to be more meaningful upgrades than what they added last year. I'll I'll, I'll say that much. And we do love the core, so we're looking forward to hopefully seeing something good develop in Pittsburgh this year. Uh, big name I feel like I can't leave on the table is Pete Alonzo. Question was asked early in the show, like yep. assessing that trade value heading into the last year of control. Uh, sort of the, you know, the, the guy people aren't talking about with all the Juan Soto indecision hanging in the balance. Seeing the name Christopher Morell in exchange for Alonzo a lot. Again, just a popular thing people putting two and two together, you know, everybody making their own rumor sandwich, like, Oh, guy and guy, like I'm thinking about Glaber Torres and Michael Bush of the Dodgers. And apparently so a lot of people are also thinking about that. Um, people are doing rumor sandwich with those two players, but what do you think Alonzo's true value is right now? And, and are the Mets is the needle moving in any direction on keeping him or selling him? I am firmly in the camp that the Mets are going to keep Pete Alonzo. And if you look at David Stearns' comments, he said that they do not plan on trading them. Obviously, that is not a guarantee that they're not going to trade them. Part of Stearns' job is to listen to what these teams present, and he's been the king of doing that in Milwaukee, and he'll continue doing that in New York. But uh, internally, the Mets view Alonzo as a really key piece to that organization, and that they want to keep him. They eventually want to keep him long term that being said i would be relatively stunned if they ended up agreeing to a contract extension before he reaches free agency mainly because scott boris is his agent and we know that he wants his players to establish their value in the open market so i would not look for an alonzo extension but i I think it could end up playing out similar to what happened with brandon nimmo who coincidentally is also a scott boris client and who ended up in free agency. He reached free agency, then he re-signed with the Mets after receiving pretty strong interest elsewhere, including from San Francisco. But um, I I don't know the odds of him eventually staying in in New York, but I think he does start the season in New York for sure. Um, And then after that, it's just a, a relatively big mystery. I agree with your inclination there for sure. Um, Well, hell of a show, especially considering all we had to fight through. I think we got through it. And I think the comment section agreed. Uh, Great, great people showing up today. Um, You guys were electric. I hope you're electric uh, for the rest of the off season too. join us. Please once a week here on this channel, Uh, we'll be streaming live uh, three 30 Eastern Thursdays. We're going to find a solution next week as well. If big shit goes down, pardon my French over the weekend. You'll definitely see us on Monday. Believe me, we'll find room before the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, yeah. And also yeah. Adam, I want to, I want to make sure we, I take the time to say this is a uh, very important time to join the discord. This yeah. is where I, in the last week or so I have dropped some nuggets in there. I've dropped a lot of different info that has not been public uh, that I have not reported I wanted it to be a Discord exclusive, as I put it. Uh, people who are in the Discord can confirm that. And joining it, I think Joanne could put the link in the chat again, yeah. uh, will make you the most informed fan in baseball. And I could not strong, I could not like be more, I could not strong or I could not recommend it enough. It is a very important resource and I would highly recommend joining. Yeah, the Discorders in the comments can confirm there's some stuff that's been dropped in there that has not gotten out to the public yet and may, hopefully, will never because we're trying to keep that under lock and key. So join if you haven't for sure. Uh, Scan again on the screen if you're interested in uh, Sleeper Daily Fantasy. If you haven't joined yet, your first deposit will be matched up to 100. The code is fansided2. That's the number two. You can see it right up there in the uh, QR code in the upper left. Robert, just before we sign off uh, and before uh, the mess hits the fan tomorrow, wondering what you're hearing on the Oakland situation and wondering what the overall vibe is among people who've reached out to you, who you've reached out to today. Because I gave my thoughts early. I yelled about it. I wore the hat in solidarity. I knew this was coming. Now you wonder expansion. You wonder what's next. Um, But what the hell, man? Like a, a unanimous vote. We knew it was coming. But what's the overall vibe? Yeah, that's uh, not a lot of people are very happy with this. And I feel really bad for the Oakland fans. And I know there's a lot of 
diehard A's fans. Uh, Matt Verderam comes to mind. He is a very loyal Oakland A's fan, so I can only imagine how he's feeling today. Uh, I think the, the sentiment is pretty strong in, in favor of the A's fans and a lot of people just being um, just really upset with John Fisher. And Fisher made comments saying that, I can't remember, well, I, or maybe it was Rob Manfred who said it, that John Fisher did a good job as as owner of the A's, or he has done a good job as the owner of the A's. I'll, I'll call bullshit on that. He is... He's not a good. He's not a good owner. He has been bad for baseball. We've seen, we've seen players on that roster or who have well previously been on that roster bash him in comments on Twitter. I would expect that to continue. Just a sad day for the A's. It was all preventable, and uh, John Fisher should be ashamed. That's I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah, he was the one this week who said no one's had it tougher than him to some protesters. Uh, I would argue that the fans who are not billionaires have probably had it tougher than John Fisher, who ultimately got what he want, even if it includes a nomadic trip across the West Coast and some random games at the Giants ballpark. Congrats. Reaping what you sow kind of sucks. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody, in the comment section. Like I said earlier, uh, you make the show go round. There's no show without you. Look out for more opportunities to drop questions ahead of time in the Discord. We got some new members today during this show, just like we were hoping for incredible uh so please visit the channel figure out uh how to get on in there too if you're not already uh and there will be more q a opportunities on robert's twitter account moving forward if there's something to talk about next week you will certainly see us if not catch you after thanksgiving with a mondo show enjoy the holiday everybody if we don't see it if we do it's going to be as good a show as ever because it's that time of year for robert murray i am adam Weiner. thanks for sticking with us thanks for the questions thanks producer joanne what a show again, and uh, take care, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you, everybody.